thanks for thanks for coming today. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Ray Take, and I want to welcome you to the first meeting of the Iran Task Force. It's hard to welcome you to an inaugural meeting of a group that has been around for a year now, uh, but. Uh, this group came together <coughs> in about a year ago, and its mission at that time was primarily to advise Congress on an entire range of issues on nuclear matters, economic sanctions, <coughs> and essentially parameters of a good deal and how to get a good deal. <coughs> During the period of intervening year, we have produced 10 memos. The copies are back there. Uh, it is a distinguished group of individuals who are members of the task force. The task force is co-directed by me and Mark Dibowitz. Uh, the best way of introducing Mark Dibowitz is to have a boxing analogy. Uh, Muhammad Ali once said about Joe Frazier, if God ever called me to holy war, I want Joe Frazier there with me. <laughs> if God ever calls you to holy war, you want Mark Dibowitz there with you. Uh, other members of the task force here are Ali and of course John. Uh, and I'll introduce John in a second, who's essentially a member of the task force and will preside over today's meeting with the task force co-chairs to be distinguished from task force co-directors and the distinction is they're much more distinguished. <laughs> so I'll turn it over to John now for conducting the rest of this conversation. Thank you. Can you hear me? Are we on? Okay. Uh, thanks Ray and thanks to everybody for coming. Uh, great turnout is a testament not only to the importance of the subject matter, but I think to the, obviously, the stellar panel that we've assembled today. Um, if a final deal is reached with Iran over the next month, it almost certainly will constitute the single most consequential national security agreement that the United States has concluded since the end of the Cold War. Not only implicates the vital interests of the United States, it touches issues that many of our closest allies in the Middle East view as nothing less than existential, literally questions of life and death for the security and well-being of their nations. Of course, one of the more notable features of our policy with respect to the Iranian nuclear issue has been the absolutely critical, indeed, I'd say, leading role that the U.S. Congress has played over the last 10 years in the development of that policy absent the kind of bipartisan majorities in both chambers that pushed relentlessly year after year on the need for increased economic pressure to get Iran to negotiate seriously, I doubt we would have ever established the extraordinarily effective sanctions regime that we now have. And without that regime, of course, the possibility of achieving any kind of satisfactory diplomatic resolution to this problem would almost certainly have been close to zero. As someone who worked in a former administration uh, that did at times actively resist the Congress's push against Iran, I think there is no doubt in retrospect that Congress, more often than not, got this issue more right than a lot of people in the executive branch, and consistently so. It better understood the urgency of the issue. It better understood what it would take in terms of U.S. leverage to make serious diplomacy possible. And it was also, frankly, consistently a better judge than a lot of other people of what the international traffic would bear in terms particularly of the reactions of our partners in the P5 plus one to any kind of determined U.S. effort to escalate crippling economic pressure against Iran. So with that important history in mind, I hope today that in addition to the uh, discussion of the emerging deal itself, we'll also be able to talk about the role of Congress in the cru crucial days, weeks, and months ahead. Another important feature of the Iranian nuclear issue is, of course, the role of intelligence. Our ability to figure out what's happening in the Iranian program has always been vital, but under this emerging deal with Iran, it looks as if it will become even more so. That's because an agreement that a lot of us once hoped would have at its heart the dismantlement of much, if not all, of Iran's critical nuclear infrastructure has now evolved into an agreement that looks like it will be more about monitoring that infrastructure. And that's going to impose a very big burden on the U.S. intelligence community for years to come to act as the early warning system that will be able to detect Iranian violations with high confidence and in a way that provides decision makers with ample time to mount an effective response. 
Uh, let me go ahead and introduce our distinguished panel briefly. Most of uh, uh, everybody here, I think, knows them, them well. Um, and as Ray said, we're very honored to call all of them co-chairs of the Iran Task Force. Senator Evan Bayh from Indiana served two terms in the U.S. Senate, following two terms as Indiana's governor. In the Senate, Senator Bayh sat on several key committees concerned with the Iranian nuclear issue, including the Banking, Armed Services, and Intelligence Committees. Uh, welcome, Senator. It's great to, to have you. Uh, Senator Joseph By uh, Lieberman from <laughs> excuse uh, Senator Joseph Lieberman from Connecticut served in the U.S. Senate for 24 years, including as a longtime pivotal member of the Armed Services Committee and as the chairman of the Homeland Sur Secu uh, Security and Governmental Affairs Committee. Uh, no exaggeration to say that Senator Lieben Lieberman was a truly pivotal voice in virtually all the major national security and foreign policy debates that the United States engaged in since the end of the Cold War, including uh, the Iranian nuclear program. So it's an honor and privilege to welcome Senator Lieberman. Finally, we also are pleased to be joined by retired Air Force four-star General Mike Hayden. Uh, at the pinnacle of his uh, long and distinguished career, General Hayden served first as the head of the National Security Agency for almost 10 years, and then as director of the CIA for nearly three years after that. He was a major player at the highest levels of the U.S. government in all of the historic events and policies that took place in that difficult decade that followed 9-11. Uh, I was lucky enough to have a front row seat at, on occasion to watch him at work in those days. Uh, he's really an amazing professional, great public servant, so thank you for being here, General Hayden. The way it will work is that I'm going to pose some questions to the panel in hopes of getting a number of, of good issues and insights on the table. That will go for about the next 35 to 40 minutes, and then we'll open it up to the floor for perhaps another 30 minutes or so for questions from the audience. So uh, let me dive right in uh, by simply asking all of you for some initial thoughts about the emerging Iran deal, at least let what we know of it coming out of, out of the Lausanne framework that was announced in the beginning of April. Assuming the deal does get done, and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on how likely you think that is, but assuming it gets done, what's your assessment? Good deal? Bad deal? Too soon to tell? Senator Lieberman? Uh, thanks, John. Great to uh, be part of this FDD uh, task force and honored to be co-chair with uh, General Hayden and Evan Bay, Senator Bay. Um, everything that uh, I, I have heard about what's happened in the negotiations uh, tells me that this will be a bad deal uh, for the United States of America and for our allies. Uh, it, if, uh, if, if it comes out otherwise, I'll be pleasantly surprised, but I think the odds uh, of that happening are uh, remote. Uh, and just to state it succinctly, and you touched on this, John, in your opening comments, um, and what I thought began as an attempt, I'm not against negotiations. You know, one negotiates with one's uh, enemies often to try to reconcile differences. But what started out, I thought, as a negotiation that intended to um, uh, remove uh, step by step the uh, uh, very uh, difficult uh, economic sanctions on uh, Iran in return for Iran uh, essentially terminating its nuclear weapons development program has now become something uh, quite different, um, notwithstanding the fact that we went into the negotiations with the advantage that the Iranians were suffering uh, from these sanctions. Uh, these economic sanctions, and what, the, what 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 we seem to be talking about now, is a um, serial um, suspension of most of the uh, economic sanctions in return for um, not the uh, elimination or end of the Iranian nuclear weapons program, but uh, a kind of dialing down temporarily, uh, with some hopefully monitoring how, how extensive it will be, I don't know. And, uh, and it, on every level, this is a disaster. I mean, we're dealing with an autocratic, repressive regime that openly states its uh, antipathy for the United States, for uh, Israel, and uh, uh, not so openly uh, expresses its antipathy for uh, most of our closest allies uh, in the Arab world, and, and they uh, know it. Um, as a result of the agreement, they're going to end up uh, having a, an enormous flow of capital uh, come back into them with which 
I mean, what's startling to me, I'm, I'm going to control myself because I want to give my two co-chairs some time to speak, but these negotiations have been going on as if they were in a bubble and there was no, uh, the negotiators had no awareness of what was happening outside. The Iranians continue to uh, kill uh, and jail their political opponents. They're tremendously repressive of dissent and of their people. They're still, they're, they put this Washington Post reporter on trial and they have gone through, we, we used to talk about uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran as an expansionist uh, hegemonic power, it, it has expanded uh, during the time of these negotiations throughout uh, the region to the great detriment of uh, our values, of our allies, and of ourselves. So uh, I'm very pessimistic about this, and I think there's really at this point only two things that can save us from a very bad consequential agreement. John, I want to pick out something you said because I think it's really important. This is, this is, in my opinion, the most serious consequential international agreement that the United States has, has entered since the end of the Cold War. It, it has that, that much of an impact uh, on us. And um, there, there are only two things that I, uh, at this point that I think can save us from this terrible agreement. Um, one is the uh, intransigence of the Supreme Leader of the Islamic Republic of Iran, who indeed may not allow... Uh, robust inspections, and I, I, I don't know how we can accept an agreement without that. Um, the second is the Congress of the United States, thanks to the bipartisan legislation that Bob Corker, uh, Bob Menendez, and Ben Cardin, and others introduced and enacted. I, I'm going to stop there. I'm happy to come back to talk about Congress's role, but uh, Congress's role is unique and critically important in the days ahead. Thank you. Senator By. Well, John. Uh, I have to, John, you go. Thank you, John. And um, let me echo my uh, friend and colleague, uh, Joe Lieberman's remarks uh, about it's a pleasure to serve with uh, General Hayden and, uh, and Senator Lieberman. So I think we're likely, I think it's highly likely we'll get a deal unless the Iranians uh, are just uh, completely uh, intransigent. I think it's likely that in the Senate you would get 60 votes. I, I think a, 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 a significant level of skepticism about the efficacy of the deal will be in order. Uh, it will be very difficult to verify their compliance. It would be very difficult to have uh, uh, sanctions, quote, snap back, close quote, into place uh, following their loosening. I think you'll even get interpretive differences, uh, John. We saw some of this after the uh, announcement of the preliminary agreement where immediately both sides uh, took uh, differing interpretations about what the words actually meant. And so it's difficult to verify and enforce a deal where there may just be, they may have sort of superficially papered over fundamental disagreements, but then immediately tr retreat to their um, respective positions uh, shortly thereafter. And so I think it will come to a vote in the Senate. Uh, my own guess is that there would be six, as all of you are aware, the Senate has to act affirmatively. Uh, and so I, there may be a filibuster uh, against uh, uh, that. My guess is there would be 60 votes to break a filibuster. Uh, to get to 67 to actually override a presidential veto, that would be a very difficult matter, particularly when you get up to 65, 66, 67 votes. But regardless, you could have an agreement going into effect where two-thirds of the American Congress, ab about roughly, a little less than two-thirds, a clear majority, would expect would have would have expressed significant reservations uh, about the agreement, and that's uh, that's uh, that's a very difficult position from which to be operating internationally, particularly with another presidential election coming up. The Iranians are going to wonder, well, what does this mean? Uh, do we go forward uh, now and uh, uh, try and push the envelope in the agreement, or do we hold back and wait and see who the next president is going to be? Uh, our allies in the region. Uh, we have a real risk of uh, this touching off uh, uh, nuclear proliferation, surely in Saudi Arabia, possibly in Egypt and uh, Turkey. So that could be an uh, unintended consequence of this that is would be really uh, destabilizing. And the other thing uh, that it's difficult to disaggregate here, uh, as hard as we might try, is the other behavior that Iran is engaged in outside of uh, the context of their nuclear program. Uh, as we're all aware, they do fund uh, Hezbollah. They're deeply involved in the civil war in Syria, deeply involved in destabilizing Yemen. And uh, to the extent that we, you know, they're clearly going to be pushing for as much immediate sanctions relief as they can get. 
That's a fancy way of saying as much money as they can get their hands on. Money is fungible. And you can bet that some of that will find its way into things, that, uh, to, to supporting activities that would not be in the national security interest of the United States. So you have to balance that off against any potential good the agreement might uh, accomplish. So that's a, a worrisome fact. Uh, their ongoing uh, ballistic missile program, those missiles can only be designed to hit either Western Europe or the continental United States uh, eventually. I think we need to be fairly clear-eyed about what's going on with that. So the final thing I would say is when you kind of drill down through all of this, we have to have a national debate about uh, what is the essential nature of the Iranian regime. Are they a normal nation state, essentially, that, I mean, we had uh, very difficult relations with the former Soviet Union during the communist period, but they weren't suicidal, they weren't a radical theocracy, uh, and we could deal with them. But is there something about the Iranian nature, uh, short of uh, committing national suicide, uh, that will continue to have them be an aggressive regional power working actively against the national security interests of the United States, undermining our allies? and quite possibly not living up to the agreement that they've signed and eventually getting a nuclear capability, uh, surely with it after 10 years under the agreement, possibly sooner if they're willing to cheat. And uh, is that something as a country that we think is consistent with our national security interests? Um, my own view is that uh, that would not be consistent with our national security interests. But I think therein lies answering that question, what is the essential nature of their regime? How are they likely to move forward? And I think there's just an abundance of evidence suggesting that uh, what they're trying to do here is get what they want and pay as uh, small a price for it as uh, they possibly can. And uh, at the end of the day, that's not good for us or for our allies. General Hayden. Well, I, I, I get to say uh, I'd like to associate myself with the remarks <laughs> of the distinguished senators from Connecticut and Indiana. Um, and I really mean that. Um, let me take a little, a little more narrow view, although I totally agree with Senator Bayh's characterization. I, I, I'd summarize it, he and I were chatting about it over our sandwiches, that we're kind of focused now by the national debate that the problem is Iran with nuclear weapons. I'd actually suggest to you that the problem is Iran. <coughs> and the, the, the nuclear weapons question is an important but a subset of the broader question of, of Iran. And, and we need to be very careful that, a, that an apparent resolution of the nuclear question is then allows us to, to mislead ourselves that we've suddenly solved the Iran question, which I think lingers for a very, very long time. Um, I also need, need to mention that, you know, in the executive branch in the last administration, we, we left this as an ugly baby for the new guys. This was not a problem that, well, oh, man, if you'd only just done what we laid out here, this had been, this had been finished in your first term. We, we, we didn't have any such plans. So I fully recognize how very, very difficult this is. All that said, to answer John's first question, uh, I do think we're trending towards a deal. I think the dynamics of the negotiation, as many of us feared, have, have created its own energy uh, in the direction of a deal. Uh, the dynamics being so strong, I think that we've gone from, if we were ever at, no deal is, is better than a bad deal, I actually think the circumstances under which we now operate because of the energy and investment that's been put in this is any deal is better than no deal. And, and I fear that's what we'll get. Uh, Senator Bayh mentioned interpretive di differences. And I really would call your attention to that as we go forward. We cannot allow either government to paper over what remain are significant differences in terms of what has been agreed. Uh, I got asked after the the, 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 the four-page white paper uh, that we put out, to, what, did, what did I think of what the white paper contained? And, and, and frankly, I, after only a day or two and watching the responses from Tehran, I have to say, I don't know that we've agreed to anything. And, and, and one needs to be really, really careful about this, particularly in the, the most narrow land I'll talk about, which is the intelligence lane, which is the, the, the verification lane. We have really got a hammer, unarguable, verification procedures into any agreement because I am here to tell you that unilateral American intelligence will be insufficient to build up enough confidence in my view that an agreement is being honored. In other words, American intelligence is good. Uh, in other words, American intelligence is going to tell you a lot. But to get to the level of confidence you will need to legitimate action 
will require an invasive inspection regime that must be negotiated before we agree to any such treaty or, or arrangement. Uh, let me stop there. John, I know there are a lot of other questions, but uh, we'll get to them. General, I might, I, I, let me just follow up quickly on, with you on this uh, question, the nature and scope of the inspection um, regime and, and particularly relating to military sites and, uh, and the ability to access and talk to Iranian scientists, if not Iranian decision makers who are involved in the nuclear program. Um, when you put on your CIA director's hat, I wonder if you could sketch out for us just, um, do you actually need uh, what everybody has called anytime, anywhere, SNAP inspections that include military and Quds Force sites? What kind of interviews? How, how far would you want to go into the Iranian nuclear weapons bureaucracy to, uh, to get answers to your questions? Um, and what would you, I mean, because it seems to me the president is asking our intelligence community via the IAEA, I suppose, to have an ability to almost instantaneously detect Iranian violations. So I wonder if you could just expand sure. a little bit. Yeah, John, I, I, I do think anytime, anywhere inspections are absolutely essential. Um, I was President Obama's CIA chief for about three weeks while we were waiting for Leon, uh, Leon Panetta to get confirmed. And I actually attended the first NSC meeting that he had uh, on Iran. And the president turned to me and, and said, General, uh, how much LEU and HEU do they have? Or MEU, medium enriched. And I actually said to the president, Mr. President, I, I actually know the answer to those questions. But, but for a moment, let me give you a different way of thinking about this issue. And what I said to the president was, sir, I don't think, I don't think anybody in my community thinks that there's an electron or a neutron at Natan is ever going to end up in a nuclear weapon. What they're building up at Natanz and other like facilities are confidence in technology. And to, to go ahead and move to HEU requires them to cheat so badly that it will be detected or to kick the inspectors out. And therefore, the, what we believe would happen in a breakout is that they would simply take the technology from Natanz and replicate it at a secret military facility and it's there in that facility that the HEU for a weapon uh, would be enriched. Now, at the time, I told the president, we knew a secret, secret nuclear facility. We knew that GUM was, was under construction. They didn't know uh, that, that we knew. Right? And, but that's the scenario that we always pictured, John. And so how do you... And so I'm an American intelligence officer, right? And I'm going to go into the president with some really bad news. All right, we, we actually have a name for this. We call this the dynamic of the unpleasant fact, okay? <laughs> so, you know, when Jim Clapper, whoever's in Jim's position now, gets to walk in and says, Mr. President, you, you recall that war you promised to start in the Persian Gulf? Well, guess what? Today's the day. Okay, what is the burden of proof on the American intelligence community? Number one, to come to that judgment. Number two, to get the American political leadership to accept that judgment. And number three, then to sell that judgment in one way or another to a broader, to a broader international community without giving up critical sources and methods. This is really hard, John. And so the presence of inspectors, the ability to go anywhere at any time, I, th I think is absolutely essential. Even with all that, is the, I mean, how do you think about this one-year breakout time that the administration has put so much focus on, not only a, the ability to detect, but as you say, the ability then to mobilize an effective and quick response within the scope of a year, perhaps getting the rest of the international community to come along to something that could include a military attack? How, yeah. just from based on your experience, yeah. how... Look, Ollie and, and Ray have written about this. And we, we, try to, we, we try to show how you can use up a, a year pretty easily, actually. First of all, you know, it, the, clock doesn't, the, okay, the clock doesn't start when you detect it. The, the one-year clock starts when they begin to violate the agreement. So there's a gap between the violation and the detection. And then all that dynamic, I suggest to you, has to take place before you get to a meaningful political decision, then happens after you have detected it and built up enough personal confidence that you want to take to the president the worst news he's going to hear in his entire administration. And so, it, it's number one, 
I think our estimate that we're, we, we, we've got them more than a year has got an awful lot of Kentucky windage in the, in the estimate. And even if it was provable, it, it may prove insufficient. Okay, uh, Senator, is, is uh, that a technical term, Kentucky windage? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been very fond of senators from Kentucky over yeah. the last 20 years. I think Senator, yeah. Paul, <laughs> Senator, <laughs> Senator Paul will define that for you. <laughs> uh, Senator Bayh, um, one of the, um, the other big issues outstanding in the talks appears to be this issue of the pace and scope of sanctions relief that Iran is going to get under this deal. Um, and there's also a, a related question of how quickly you could revive these sanctions. The kind of term of art that everybody's latched onto now is snapback sanctions. Um, you and Senator Lieberman were heavily involved and watched how long it took to actually get in place this the kind of effective sanctions architecture that we have now. Um, so looking at this, how realistic do you find this idea of snapback? Well, John, as I indicated in my opening remarks, I think um, you know uh, it would be very difficult to achieve a snapback once you've uh, significantly reduced uh, the sanctions regime. As you pointed out, it took a lot of time and effort to put it into effect. Uh, we made them progressively more stringent, and they have exacted a real toll on the Iranian economy. Uh, we backed off some, but uh, the sanctions were... Uh, in significant de degree responsible for slower economic growth, a, a devaluation of the Iranian currency, a very high level of inflation uh, within Iran, and the regime has been very concerned about that. Once we back off of that, you know, clearly what they're going to want is as much relief as soon as they can get it. And uh, so we'll have to negotiate over all that. But once you've backed off, once the Europeans, the Chinese, and others have begun to reenter the Iranian market, uh, sign uh, a variety of economic agreements, uh, you know, uh, money flowing back and forth, it is very, very hard, let alone the Russians, very, very difficult uh, to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And I would say, realistically, if you want to be uh, uh, you know, practical about it, pra practically, impossible to accomplish. And so the real answer to your question is, if the decision about reimposing sanctions was going to be made solely in Washington, D.C., that would be one thing. But uh, without all of our allies, and even those who aren't our allies, who would be important to any sort of meaningful sanctions regime coming along, it's just not going to happen. And they're going to be highly reluctant to go back uh, once they have... Um, uh, really re reestablished meaningful financial and economic relations. So it's just not practical, I think. Senator Lieben, do you want to make a quick comment on that? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I agree with everything uh, Evan said. There's a danger uh, in this uh, next weeks of negotiation that the U.S. will agree to suspend a lot of the sanctions on Iran and the reassurance that um, uh, the administration will give us is that they'll be prepared to snap them back. But it's not, as Evan said, it's not going to be so easy. So uh, r really, in my opinion, um, w we ought to be halting and uh, demanding in our lifting of sanctions until we see that the Iranians are s substantially complying with whatever promises they make as a final agreement. Because a, a, a backstop that you're going to snap back after you suspend a lot of the sanctions early on before the Iranians have proved anything to us about their behavior is really uh, not much of a guarantee at all. In, incidentally, if I can add here, I, I, th there's a natural sort of rhythm to congressional focus, as we, we and probably a lot of other people in the room can tell you. Congress did something extremely important and, and quite unique in adopting the Corker, Menendez, uh, Cardin, et cetera, legislation. Um, in my time, I don't remember anything quite like it. Uh, one of the, if I may just digress for a moment, one of the wonderful opportunities I've had in the last couple of years since I left the Senate is that I've taught a course at Columbia Law School in something, one of the few legal subjects I probably know something about, the role of Congress in American foreign and defense policy. There's a wonderful quote from a political scientist, Edward Corwin, and I paraphrase, who said that the Constitution invites the President and Congress to compete um, forever 
for the privilege of determining American foreign and defense policy. In this case, first with the sanctions and then with this extraordinary um, requirement that this agreement come to Congress for review and possible rejection, uh, Congress has done something really significant, which is a measure of the broad bipartisan anxiety about the direction of these negotiations. And I think what members of Congress in both parties are hearing from their constituents, which is also uh, anxiety about what's what's happening in the negotiations with the Iranians. Uh, so what, here, coming back to the rhythm of Congress, there's a natural way in which Congress will now uh, step back and wait for the agreement to occur. I, I wish as a logical corollary or a follow-on of adopting the Corker legislation that Congress could get together on a similarly bipartisan basis and essentially say to the administration and the P5 plus one and Iran, by a letter, by a joint resolution, here are conditions that we consider minimal for us to accept and not reject an agreement that uh, you reach. I don't know that that's going to happen, but I think that that would be important. If I could add just uh, two other quick points, uh, John. The, the interpretive differences that I uh, referenced and that General Hayden spoke about, uh, it is it is very important that there be a meaningful period uh, for verification. Uh, if we just allow the Iranians to get a significant amount of sanctions relief until we can uh, assure ourselves that we actually have a quote unquote agreement, uh, not just that the, and that we uh, the, and that both sides uh, have a consensus on what the words on the document mean, it would be folly to, to grant relief. You'd be granting relief only to discover possibly fairly quickly that in fact you don't have a meeting of the minds. So you need some period to a meaningful period to v verify that a you have an agreement, test the bona fides of the uh, of the Iranians. That's the first point. The second point, refresh my memory, where the French. Uh, being fairly um, uh, hard-nosed, was it about uh, any time, anywhere inspections or about uh, the phasing in of sanctions? Inspe relief? Inspections. 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 Okay, well, you asked me about sanctions relief, so I won't – I was just going to say it, uh, it should uh, be a matter of some concern to us if the French are being more, more hard-nosed than we are uh, in the course of the negotiations. That might be a sign that something is amiss. Uh, Senator Lieberman, I, um, I do want to come back quickly on, on Corker. Cardin in a second, but first I, I just want to probe you on this, kind of the anomaly we face where we, the United States has led a negotiation on this deal, our, two of our primary international rivals for power and influence, China and Russia, seem to like the deal and are going to sign on. On the other hand, some of our best allies in the region seem to hate, hate this deal and despite what President Obama said in a recent interview that no one will have more at stake in this nuclear deal than, than himself, I think some of our allies would, might, might dispute that. Um, how, do you, how should we think about that, that countries like Israel, the Saudis, some of our allies in the Gulf um, really feel threatened by, by this deal? How do we weigh that in the, in, in the balance of deciding whether or not this makes sense or not? Well, we, we the United States, should weigh it um, have a, weigh, weigh the reaction of our allies who are in Iran's neighborhood heavily as we consider uh, going forward um, because they're in the neighborhood and uh, they're the target of, um, of uh, Iranian uh, 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 hatred, anger. Um, we, we've all talked to them. We're talking about the Israelis and, and the Arabs and they can't believe that we're negotiating as uh, wholesomely as we are with the Iranians, because they say this regime since 1979 has given us no reason to trust them. Uh, uh, you'd have to have a very demanding agreement with really anytime, anywhere inspections that, that really ended the Iranian nuclear program for our um, best allies, Israel and the, and the uh, so-called moderate Arabs, to uh, f feel unthreatened um, by it, and, and uh, it, so it, it has, um, the fact that we've gone forward has really diminished our credibility with our allies in the region and our influence with our allies in the region. 
and I think it will diminish our ability to keep the region peaceful. Uh, my colleagues have talked about the fact that the Saudis will, will definitely, well, they've said it, uh, will, will definitely match every step that they know that the Iranians are taking uh, to develop uh, nuclear weapons. The, the Israelis still reserve the right to take military action, to, to disable the Iranian program because they think it is that much of an existential threat. And beyond the immediate region, um, this is the age of instant global communications. Our allies in the rest of the world, begin with Asia, go to Eastern Europe particularly, go to Africa, go to Latin America, they're watching this. And I, part of what they're seeing is that we have not involved or listened to our closest allies in the Middle East as we've gone ahead with these negotiations. And that makes them anxious that we will uh, pay as little attention to them if the, 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 the hegemonic power in their region begins to uh, move on them. I know the, the U.S. may feel that we can sell more arms to our allies in the Middle East. We can promise that we'll put an umbrella over them should the Iranians go nuclear. But I'm afraid that as a result of the way we've conducted ourselves, including in these negotiations, they don't trust uh, that uh, promise of American, um, uh, uh, American guarantee of their security the way they used to. Uh, General Hayden, I, I wonder if I could just uh, ask you on, on Israel and the question of the viability of an Israeli military strike to set back the Iranian nuclear program, either with a deal or without a deal, but just how viable as a technical matter do you think that that is? John, my, my consistent judgment has been it's not all that viable. Uh, that's not to discount the IAF and the professionalism, the pilots, and the excellence of its intelligence. But, you know, physics enter in here pretty quickly. It's far. It's a thousand miles. Uh, the Air Force is small. The target base is dispersed. The targets are numerous. Many of the targets are hardened. And, frankly, neither we nor the Israelis are sure we know where everything is. And if the Israelis get to do this, it's a raid. It's not a campaign. They get to do it once. And because of the great distances involved, even, even some of the fighter aircraft, I suspect, rather than be carrying ordnance, would have to buddy refuel the, the weapons carriers in order to get into the target area and have enough time to maneuver and safely to get home. Um, so my, my judgment is this is a really hard do for them. I don't think there's anyone that I know of in the IDF or Israeli intelligence who thinks this is a really great idea. They'll do what they're told, and they'll do it well. But then the strategic question then becomes, John, would any Israeli government put the only strategic relationship on which the survival of the Israeli state depends at risk for a single raid that would probably set the program back, if successful, three to six months? And my sense is the answer to that is no. Can I just ask our senators, there is a, uh, quite a bit of discussion now about the kinds of benefits in the aftermath of a deal that the United States might provide some of our allies, um, talking about Israel in particular and some of the questions that General Hayden raised, uh, there's been a little bit of talk, I don't know how realistic it would be, that we ought to provide Israel with the kinds of capabilities, specifically something like the massive ordnance penetrator, our biggest bunker buster, as well as a platform to deliver those um, to establish kind of the credibility of that Israeli option to make sure the Iranians at least have got to worry about the Israelis in, in terms of violating any deal. Can I just get your views on whether you would be supportive of that kind of? Um, I would. I, I'm a little bit distant from what's being discussed on uh, Capitol Hill or between the Israeli government and the U.S. government. Um, but, um, you know, there's, there's great bipartisan support for Israeli security, great concern about the impact of a nuclear Iran on Israeli security. So it's possible that the discussion um, will get to that. And it does have a deterrent, it, it should have an, a, a deterrent effect uh, on uh, Iran. Um, incidentally, it, and no one is, in Israel is really talking actively about a military strike, but for it to happen, it seems to me, the Israelis would have to have intelligence that there was a breakout occurring. In other words, it couldn't, I don't see how plausibly, for the reasons General Hayden 
said that the Israelis could just say, this is a bad deal, they're going to get nuclear weapons in 10 years, we got to stop them now. I think there'd have to be evidence that there was a breakout. Intelligence, a uh, tough decision for any uh, Israeli government at that point. Do you share it with, as, as General Hayden said, our, um, the, the, the Israelis' f foremost strategic ally, uh, and challenge the United States to take action, or do you take action yourself? It's, it's, uh, and of course, the general is right about the relative capacity uh, of the Israelis to do damage. I, I believe they could do some damage. They might have some surprising um, allies along the distance <laughs> from um, Israel to <laughs> uh, Iran who would help them uh, refuel, et cetera. But it's, it's still a very difficult mission. And you know, the Iranians have been preparing for this for a long time. That is, they've been acting defensively. The, unlike the uh, Iraqi nuclear facility or the Syrian facility, this is really a dispersed operation. And as uh, somebody, who, a, a great man who I respect greatly, who used to work for the IAE once said to me, um, there's not been a time in the, tw in the last 25 years where there ha hasn't been a part of the Iranian nuclear program that we haven't known about. And so you've got to assume that that's probably true today. Yeah. Uh, Senator, by one of the, um, one of the big, um, I guess, criticisms that the administration throws back at the skeptics of this deal is that um, while the deal's not perfect, it's good enough and it's better than any alternative that the, uh, the opponents of this particular deal have, have put forward, that nothing that has been put forward as an alternative is, in fact, particularly realistic. Um, it tends to be very idealistic, I think the administration would say. I, I, I wonder what your view of that is. Um, was it ever true? Is it true now? Um, and if there is an alternative out there, what, what do you think are the, the outlines of it? Well, first, with regard to your last uh, question, John, I, I would be for all for giving uh, the state of Israel any uh, weapons they need to defend themselves. Uh, with regard to uh, launching a preemptive strike against Iranian uh, nuclear facilities, I think we'd need to think about that. And the reason for that is not that I would be reluctant to have the Israelis have such weapon systems, is that I think it may be a distinction without a difference, because if the Israelis attack the, the Iranian sites, there is no way the Iranians will believe that we weren't completely involved in such a thing and would probably uh, react toward us uh, the way they would react if we just did it ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so I think we need to just think through the whole uh, idea of preemption and uh, whether you really, by sort of outsourcing it to the Israelis, have gotten yourself anything. Not clear to me that you really, that you really have. Uh, and the other thing, the general knows far more about this than I do, but my understanding is that you know, a one-off raid, I mean, it, to really do this right, it would take a longer period of time. You'd need to, to ensure yourself, you're going to take all the downside of going through a course of action like that, and the downside would be significant. You'd need to you know, try and maximize the chances that you were actually going to be effective. And in order to do that, you'd need to bring down the Iranian uh, air defense capabilities. You'd need to be able to revisit the target from time to time. I mean, it's a, it's a, a, a bigger undertaking that probably we and we alone are, are presently situated to do. So that's uh, with regard to that. Uh, so I'm not sure really what you bought yourself mm -hmm. um, by doing what you uh, indicated. With regard to um, is a better deal, well look, I think, you know, candidly, uh, you do encounter situations in life where they're just, uh, are not great alternatives. And this may be one of them. I mean, there are, this is a difficult situation. If it weren't, it would have been solved a long time ago. And I th one of the reasons it's so difficult, it, is, it does deal with the essential nature of the Iranian regime. And uh, are they willing to essentially change themselves and their aspirations in some pretty significant ways? You have to be a little skeptical about that. And so um, in terms of alternatives, John, I would say, uh, you know, if I were still voting on these things, I think the status quo is better than a bad deal. Now, the counter-argument against that is that, uh, well, the Iranians will just uh, immediately try and break out and achieve a nuclear capability you know, they, if, they, uh, uh, if they can't get some sanctions relief. Well, if that's how they're going to behave, then you really know who you're dealing with. And if that's how you think that they're going to behave, well, then what does it suggest about their good faith in complying with any sort of agreement you strike with them? So, um, you know, their economy has come back some. The sanctions have been uh, uh, relaxed some, 
but it's still not great there domestically right now. And so I think a legitimate alternative would be to just say, look, we've tried and tried, and to put it back on the Iranians and say, you just haven't been willing to come far enough in terms of meaningful inspections, in terms of a reasonable period uh, where each side can verify the good faith of the other, and we just can't get there. And to kind of maintain the status quo and see how they behave. I think that is a um, perfectly legitimate uh, alternative in a situation where there are no perfect or great ones. Uh, Senator Lieberman, um, I don't know if you want to comment on your idea of an alternative. Um, one thing you suggested that could, in theory, happen, although I'd like your assessment of the likelihood that, in fact, Congress gets the 67 votes to disapprove this deal and override any presidential veto. But what would be the consequences of, of that, do you think? The administration talks a lot about the Iranians either racing ahead, this will be either an Iranian bomb or war, and the collapse of our position with our international friends who have signed up for this particular deal. Is any of that realistic? Uh, let, let me start with the, uh, my own prediction about what happens if, assuming there's an agreement, and assuming it's as bad as I believe it will be, um, it's still going to, I believe Congress will reject the agreement, which, as Evan said before, should not be minimized. It's quite a remarkable statement to the world that the president has negotiated an agreement which bipartisan majorities in Congress will reject. Um, and then, really, it is his, uh, his agreement. Then the question is, he vetoes it, presumably. Is it possible to get two-thirds in both houses? It's difficult. It really is. But I think it's doable. I think you need about a third of the Democrats to, to join most of the Republicans. I don't know that all the Republicans will vote to override a veto. And I believe at that point there's going to be a massive uh, mobilization of people who feel that we're at a turning point in history, that, that uh, if, 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 this, if a bad deal goes forward uh, and the Iranians are on the road to nuclear weapons, it compromises the security first and foremost of us, our children and grandchildren. And as Evan said, uh, the Iran uh, I'll just say it a little differently. They're, they're working on these uh, ballistic missiles, not because they want to, the Iranians, not because they want to be in range of Israel or Saudi Arabia. They already are in range. They already have missiles in range of their uh, regional um, uh, antagonists, if I can put it that way. Th these, are, these are missiles long range that are um, that have the U uh, Europe and the U.S. in mind in, in a potential uh, kind of Cold War or hot war situation. So I think it's possible. I mean, bottom line, hard to get two-thirds in both chambers, but possible uh, if the deal is as bad as I think it's going to be. I forgot the second part of the question. No, no, that, that, okay. uh, I, I, I think that does it. I, oh, what, what happens then, sh real short, tougher sanctions. And I know we're going to lose some of our allies in this. But access to the U.S. banking system is still the, the well, I was about to say the gold standard. There's a little, little, uh, little <laughs> mixing of metaphors there. It's, it's what uh, you got to have in world business. So we, if we stick with it and add to the sanctions, we still have uh, the capacity what to hopefully bring them back to the table for a, a more reasonable negotiation. If I could just add two things, John. Uh, the... the uh, well, the second, the first of which involves um, Congress. I do think this very intense debate we're having about uh, fast track for potential trade agreements has required the administration to spend a significant amount of political capital. Mm -hmm. Coming just a few months thereafter to have another very difficult, heavy lift in Congress where there is a significant substantive cons skepticism and concern would be even more difficult. And so I think. As I said, I think the 60 votes would be there to get the 67. You know, that's, you know, that's hard. But I think you'd be within two or three votes of such a thing, maybe even a vote of such a thing, depending on how it all played out. So I do think that this trade uh, debate that's taking place and the uh, internal dynamics, particularly within the Democratic Party, over that do affect uh, this to some, uh, some extent. The other thing I'd say is... I think the most effective argument made uh, by the uh, administration and their allies is something along the following lines. Look, who are we kidding here? 
uh, the Chinese and the Russians and possibly some others are about to head south on the sanctions regime anyway. It's all going to go away whether we want it to or not because they're going to, you know, they're just going to head for the, the hills on this thing. So we may as well try and get whatever we can, even though, you know, kind of we won't say it publicly, but even though we all know it's not really what any of us would like. And I think the counter argument to that is uh, you probably have it, and that's why I get back to the status quo. The economy is not good in Iran right now. My guess is you have a better chance of convincing uh, those countries who are perhaps contemplating uh, 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 taking themselves out of the sanctions regime, a better chance of getting them to remain in place for a uh, some some period of time uh, than you do uh, at this moment of really hammering out an agreement that a majority of Congress would look at and say, that's a good agreement. We can verify it. Uh, the sanctions, uh, you know, I think your, your chances of maintaining what we currently have are better than getting a, an acceptable agreement. Mm. So I think the better counter, counter argument to that. All right. Uh, thanks. I'm getting the uh, notice that we need to move to the audience Q&A. I think we've got some, some microphones out there. So why don't we just go first to here in the second row. Can you please state your name, any affiliation, and uh, please state it as, as in the form of a question as best you can. Yes, my name is uh, Jim Rickards. I'm a portfolio manager with West Shore Funds. I have a question for General Hayden. Um, General, the effectiveness of the sanctions depended upon U.S. control with the dollar payment system and, by extension, control with our allies of the SWIFT payment system. In addition to acquiring uranium, uh, Iran, along with Russia and China, in the last five years have acquired 6,000 tons of gold and are building out an alternative payment system. So my question is, uh, the panel has talked about how snapback may be problematic, but even if you did snapback, is it possible that it will be ineffective because Iran will have extricated itself from the dollar payment system before that happens? Thank you. Uh, I'll comment on that, but not too much because it's it's a bit out of my lane in terms of how that it works. But at the geopolitical level, I take the point, and it's a very serious one. Uh, Senator Lieber mentioned about banking system being the gold standard, um, and, and we and we know that. And, and and frankly, targeted sanctions and and what we're able to do with regard to global finance, I would say, have become the PGMs, the precision guided munitions of the 21st century. That said. The more you use it, the more you motivate other people to build an alternative system. I don't know that the Chinese are doing that because of this. I think they're doing what it is they're doing because of their own economic self-interest. But it does make our use of these kinds of tools more challenging in the future because our control is less, of, less exhaustive. I don't know that it's in place qu quickly enough to do what you said for this problem, but it certainly certainly something that's facing us, if not over this ridge line, over the second or third out there ahead of us. I just put in a quick uh, plug for FDD's Center for Illicit Finance and, uh, and, and Sanctions, which is actually looking at precisely this kind of threat um, in economic warfare, uh, right here in the fourth row. Hi, Rachel Oswald, uh, CQ Roll Call. Uh, my question is a bit of a hypothetical, and I, I apologize for that. But assuming that there is a nuclear deal that broadly follows the um, preliminary framework of April 2nd, and assuming that uh, Congress is not able to overcome um, a veto of any resolution of disapproval, what would the panel like to see happen in 2017 when there's a new U.S. president? Anybody want to? Well, you know, when I was in elective office, my staff uh, told me never answer a hypothetical. <laughs> but now that I'm out there, you know, born free again. Um, so that's a really interesting question. Assuming there is an agreement, uh, it's rejected, President Vito's veto is not overridden. Uh, what happens? Um, uh, well, the uh, first question is, does the new president in 2017 continued to abide by the agreement. Um, and there's a real pressure on any administration not to break an agreement that a predecessor made. So there's, there'll be pressure on that. Um, a new president, uh, whoever it is, might, um, I should say whoever he or she is, might um, be tougher on the, on the details and, and the uh, implementation of the agreement. The other thing that probably would happen up here on Capitol Hill is that um, there would be, and there probably, I hope there would be first a very aggressive oversight 
of the uh, sanctions and the lifting of sanctions that's occurred uh, after the agreement is implemented. And there'd probably be, particularly with regard to Israel, uh, an attempt to uh, uh, get, mandate that the administration, hopefully with the support of the administration, uh, uh, provide weapon systems to Israel with which they could uh, defend themselves or, in a, in a, if the circumstance arose, be more effective in an initiative against an Iranian uh, breakout, nuclear breakout, all hoping that that would be a deterrent. But I'm, I'm, I'm really blue skying there. Um, because I, I think we'd be in a, a very bad uh, situation. Uh, but the real, the real gut, guts move would be for a new president to say this is a bad deal and find a way uh, to get out of it. Not easy. Right here. Right here. And then we'll go to the back. Fred. Uh, thank you. Um, my question is for Senator Lieberman. Um, Just identify yourself quick. Oh, yes. Connor Wolf with the Daily Caller News Foundation. Um, Lindsey Graham has um, positioned himself at, with, um, with having um, a lot of experience with foreign policy, and that's why he should be president. In your personal view, does this experience, um, would this experience be good um, with this type of deal in maintaining or helping future deals? Is he the leader we need? <laughs> <laughs> you ready for an endorsement? Yeah, yeah. well, he's a great friend. Uh, so I'm going to answer it quickly because uh, I, I know that others want to talk about the negotiations with Iran. It, I mean, Lindsay is uh, extraordinarily experienced and uh, informed uh, on matters of foreign and defense policy and is uh, is a <laughs> is capable of making tough decisions so i i have a, a lot of respect um, in addition to affection um, for uh, him um, he has been quite outspoken on the question of these negotiations probably as outspoken against the direction they're taking as um, and any, anybody has been. So you could expect that, um, e e well, between now and then and his role in Congress, including as the chair now of the um, Foreign Operations Appropriations Subcommittee, the Senate Appropriations, that he will be uh, trying to use that leverage in various ways to either inhibit a bad agreement or strengthen our uh, allies in the region. Uh, Fred, in the back. Fred Fleitz with the Center for Security Policy. I have a question for Senator Lieberman. Uh, Senator, a member of the panel, uh, Ali Hanonan, has said that Iran has yet to provide a convincing explanation for why it is enriching uranium. Now, Prime Minister Netanyahu said there's only one purpose Iran is enriching uranium, to make nuclear bombs. Um, the Center for Security Policy believes there's no possible reason for an agreement that allows Iran to operate thousands of centrifuges, it, develop advanced centrifuges during an agreement. So my question for you, Senator, do you think it is possible to have a meaningful nuclear agreement with Iran that allows it to continue to enrich uranium? Uh, quite simply and, and clearly, no. I don't. I mean, I, I thought the original purpose of these negotiations was to stop the Iranian nuclear uh, enrichment program in return for the uh, uh, sequential elimination of all the economic sanctions, which is quite significant for Iran and quite significant uh, when you think about it, that it, that has unfortunately uh, nothing to do with its terrible human rights record, with its expansionism in the region, with its support of terrorism. But to let that enrichment go on, uh, uh, to me, just shows that the, uh, as, as Ayatollah Khamenei said himself last fall, the Americans w um, obviously want this agreement much more than we do, said he. Um, that's never where you want to be in a negotiation. Thank you. Jessica Schulberg with the Huffington Post. Uh, General Hayden, there is talk about how the deal would put an incredible burden on the intelligence community to um, detect violations in time to give the president enough time to react. Can you sort of explain to me why the proposed deal would require Iran to follow the additional protocol, which would expand, or expand inspections, 
does that put the intelligence community in a better situation than they are now to detect breakout? Anything, anything that adds to the ability of the IAEA to, to, to visit quickly where they believe to be suspect activity would give me greater confidence in our ability to verify the information. You know, American intelligence is not without tools here. And, and frankly, I don't think I'm betraying any national secrets to, to saying that the IAEA is certainly open to suggestions from member states as to issues that raise concern, which they want to share with, with the international body. So there, there could be, in, in a very positive and open way, a, a, a cooperative relationship here that then gets us to the level of confidence that we need. And if Iran is not cheating, and if Iran is truly serious about this agreement, that sort of thing is precisely the sort of thing they should welcome in terms of, you know, I think the term we use when we're negotiating with the Soviets with confidence building measures. We go to the back here. Thank you. Uh, Chris Bidwell from the Federation of American Scientists. Thank you all for some great presentations, very informative. Uh, I'd like to follow up on something Senator Bai had talked about, and that was the issue of going with the status quo. Uh, if we go with the status quo, that means somebody probably walked away. How significant is it for the continuation of sanctions policy if it's the Iranians who walk away versus the U.S., especially if the P5, <laughs> the other P5 members might want to stay with, with, with the negotiation? I think that would certainly be a relevant factor, um, certainly would affect public opinion uh, about how the American people and possibly other publics uh, perceive such a thing. It may be also why, I mean, it's conceivable that we're going to get up to a deadline and it's not unknown in these sorts of situations for the deadlines to be extended even again. Now, I know we've said June 30th is the, the final, final drop dead uh, deadline, but uh, it might be that we achieved the status quo by both sides uh, sort of realizing that it was not in neither of their interests to be perceived as, quote, walking away, and so uh, the, uh, uh, the talks went into a hiatus of some kind and would give each side the ability to uh, kind of put their own spin on why an agreement was not reached. But it would, it, clearly it would, it would benefit our position if the Iranians were perceived as being intransigent and just uh, and, and walking away from the talks. Yeah, I, I agree. And um, Evan said earlier, and I agree with this too, that uh, the, the status quo is better than a bad deal, and unless we're all shocked by what comes out of the uh, negotiations, it's going to be a very bad deal. Um, but probably the, in some ways, uh, the best of all, if I can put it that way, barring a really good deal, would be that the Iranians uh, walk away, that their uh, stubbornness stops uh, a very uh, good deal for them. And then I think you have the possibility of uh, increasing the economic sanctions on Iran uh, and having that be done by more than the United States. And that gives us at least some small hope that sometime in the future uh, Iran would return to the table uh, for a, a better negotiation. Just to follow up, uh, I, I'm expecting a deal. So I'm not expecting the, you know, the situation that you're, you're positing. But uh, I also wouldn't expect us to sort of announce, well, we've you know, given up and are walking away. I don't think we'd put ourselves in that posture. That wouldn't be too smart. I think we'd say we, we haven't given up hope. We haven't gotten there by the deadline. And so both sides need a period of, you know, for reflection to see if there's not more they can do to kind of reach it. something along those lines that would allow each side to avoid the stigma of being perceived as the, the, the cause of the uh, of an agreement not having been reached. We had a question over here in the front. Hi, Amit Sharma, Empowerment Capital, former uh, U.S. Treasury. I wanted uh, to see your um, any of your gentlemen's uh, comments on the efficacy of economic sanctions, whether in the context of status quo or in the context of a snapback, if we're seeing, and all have commented on the very real impacts to Iran broadly with respect to economic sanctions, if the goal and intent for economic sanctions is to target behavior and change behavior, but you're still having very real impacts to retail, commercial, legitimate interests in Iran, how does in the context of a snapback or in the context of status quo, more or stronger economic sanctions achieve the goal? Well, first, uh, my hat's off to the people in the Treasury who did a lot of great work on this issue. That's true. Uh, really over an extended period of time and repeatedly coming up with uh, 
more effective ways to um, uh, to put sanctions in place. So the Treasury Department uh, did a uh, did a great job. But look, the history of sanctions is that they're not perfect. Uh, as, uh, there was a previous question about the Iranians finding ways to work around them and so forth. But they are they are imposing a real cost upon the the Iranian economy, which uh, the regime is. You know, not entirely impervious to. They're willing to see their public absorb a fair amount of uh, economic pain to pursue their broader objectives, but they're also sensitive to unrest in their society and a variety of other things. And so uh, to the extent that the Iranian economy is not growing as robustly as it otherwise might, by definition, that means they have less resources with which to pursue their other objectives, including in Syria, Yemen, and elsewhere. So it's not a perfect instrument. And in particular, when you're dealing, and there are other countries you're familiar with, I'm sure, that we've imposed sanctions on, and they are willing to see their publics have imposed upon them a fair amount of economic hardship. But that does not mean that the tool, that they are completely oblivious to the tool. As a matter of fact, here's another way to answer your question. I don't think they'd be at the table talking today if they weren't feeling some uh, urgency about getting the sanctions removed, which in itself is probably an argument for trying to maintain a meaningful sanctions regime for as long as we can. Well, I, I agree with that. As you know, there's, a, there's billions of dollars being held now, which will be, uh, some has been let go for every month uh, since the uh, interim agreement. Uh, but um, th that'll be a tremendous infusion of capital into Iran. Um, they've, they've been hurting. And uh, while they're a, a, a totalitarian government in that sense, they're not uh, unmindful. They're, they're not a popular government. <laughs> from everything we know in their own country. And uh, to the extent that there's economic deprivation in the country, it creates the possibility of instability um, and, and, and an uprising. Uh, so I think that, uh, incidentally, I'm, I want to pat Congress on the back, maybe because we were both there and patting us on the back. I apologize for that. But this was, going back to what I said about my law school, teaching experience. This has been a case where Congress inserted itself into foreign policy. And it's another going back to what John said. It didn't matter what the party of the administration in the White House was. They didn't want Congress getting involved in this. But uh, for a lot of reasons, they had uh, a broader uh, range of issues they were dealing with bilaterally, multilaterally. But Congress got focused on it in a bipartisan way, adopted it. The administration really through the Treasury Department, uh, the last two administrations did a tremendous job of implementing. And, and I agree with Evan, that's the only reason the, the, uh, the Iranians came to the table. And what agitates me is that they're gonna walk away from the table with the sanctions being removed and they're gonna have given us very little in terms of uh, the elimination, there won't be elimination, they'll dial down a little bit on their uh, nuclear uh, weapons program enrichment and all the rest. And th that's why I keep saying I'm, I'm fearful it's going to be a very bad deal. Can I just add one, one point on that with regard to capacity? I mean, there are multiple purposes for sanctions, as you know. There's punishment, there's changing behavior, and then finally there's reducing capacity. Um, you, you've all got our view on whether we're getting a good or bad or no deal. All right, we, we think likely a deal and not good. But let's just assume for a minute, let's just fantasize for a moment, we get a good deal. All right? You still have to live, and I think that's what Senator Lieberman was, was suggesting, you still have to live with massively increased Iranian capacity right. because you now have relieved them of sanctions and allow them to, to gather resources to be used for all of the other activities that, for, about which they're unrepentant. I was just going to add one final thing. Um, there are no, there are no great alternatives here. You're running risks no matter which course of action you take. But w one of the risks we could conceivably be taking under a, a quote unquote bad agreement would be the Iranians at some point, in their view, sooner rather than later, will get their hands on billions of additional dollars that have you know, piled up in uh, bank accounts they don't have access to right now. If they're allowed to fully uh, export their petroleum capacity once again, reduce the price of oil a little bit, but that's still going to be additional tens of billions of dollars flowing into the Iranian treasury. Uh, so if we have not given ourselves a grace period to verify their good faith that they're complying with the agreement, if we don't have in place you know, strict inspections to assure ourselves that they're abiding by the agreement, there's going to be huge additional resources for 
their ballistic missile program, for what they're doing in Syria and Yemen, for, um, well, if they haven't really in their hearts given up their nuclear aspirations for possible, um, you know, additional covert uh, activities there. So we were really empowering them with the potential to do uh, a lot of things. And, uh, you know, th this is outside the, the subject of this conference and these negotiations, but, uh, you know, clearly they're a state sponsor of terrorism and uh, giving someone like that tens of billions of additional dollars um, will lead to uh, adverse consequences. I, w I wonder if I can just impose on our, our two senators here to give us some, uh, a peek inside. Come July, let's say we've got a deal. We've got a deal as problematic as you all say. Right. Uh, you're a Democratic senator. Yeah. What is it like? I mean, what kind of we saw we saw the administration, the president earlier in the year, I yeah. think, call critics of the deal, uh, warmongers. Um, we saw them say uh, accuse certain members of maybe being political opportunists who were paying more attention to a domestic constituency than to uh, to u s. national interests. Um, but he is a lame duck president. I mean, what 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 are the kinds of pressures and calculations that you face that make it so difficult to get? 13 or 14 or 15 Democratic senators right. to say this is not <laughs> well, a good th deal. This is, a, this is all about what the Democrats do. I presume the Republican leadership will try to uh, keep all the Republicans in, in the moment, where, which will be the moment of truth here, on the vote to whether to override the president's veto of a rejection or not. Uh, the president's the titular head of the of the Democratic Party. There are a lot of Democrats who who like him, who feel uh, a kind of responsibility uh, to him. Um, the minister, the president, uh, hasn't done this a lot. What I'm about to say, but he he probably would in this case. He'll meet with people. He'll he'll call people. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of that personal outreach. The leadership, Democratic leadership, will make it a test of loyalty. On the other side. There will be, I, I believe, a very substantial sort of organization of people I in the districts of the uh, swing Democratic voters in the Senate and the House, the undecided, and and they'll the members will have to put this together. I mean, part of it will be, I mean, in some sense, not this simple really, loyalty to the president. Maybe some of them will agree. Well, the ones who agree that it's not a, a bad deal and a good deal will be in the category of those who will not uh, vote to override uh, a veto. But that group in the middle will be affected by that. Uh, Evan said a fascinating thing, which I think is really important to remember, which is that um, the Democrats in the House particularly are going to be squeezed in the coming <laughs> days and weeks about the Trade Promotion Authority. And therefore, they're going to come to this vote, if it happens over the summer, with that kind of feeling in their minds. I just, forgive me, just a moment. This is, you know, old war stories. You took me back to a point, I guess it was 1997, I think, uh, in the Clinton administration. We had been through the Balanced Budget Act, and the Clinton White House had to really work on Democrats to support it. This was Bill Clinton and Newt Gingrich coming to this incredible agreement, and it had stuff in it that a lot of Democrats really didn't like, although it ended up um, creating a surplus in the federal government. Anyway, a, a short period of time after that, by historic irony, <laughs> comes the Trade Promotion Authority bill, <laughs> as in right now, pass the Senate, goes to the House. Um, I get a call from the White House, John Bro and I, um, we're both active in the Democratic Leadership Council, a moderate Democratic group. Uh, there were more moderate Democrats in those days. <laughs> but they said the president is inviting uh, about 30 of the moderate center-left Democrats who are undecided on trade promotion authority to come down to the White House tomorrow. Will you and bro, and I forgot who else came out from was there. Maybe you were there. Uh, to, to join us in the pitch. The president came out. He spoke movingly. We all just spoke from our guts. I thought it was going really well. John Podesta was the um, chief of staff to the president then. And as they all left, I, I waited. I lingered. And I said, John, I thought that went well. What did you think? He said, a lot of these people are not happy with us about the balanced budget uh, a mem uh, bill that we just passed. He said, you and everybody else, the president, were really fantastic today. And here's my prediction. Tomorrow, they're going to feel really badly when they vote against us. 
<laughs> and okay, long story, but it shows the human dimension to uh, really enormous uh, uh, national security and global issues. And I think Evan may have had a very good point uh, today. Many good points, but that one really struck me. <laughs> First time for everything. <laughs> Any other questions out in the audience? Yeah, Rafi Dangzinger. Thank you, I'm Rafi Danziger, an advisor to APAC. And to my question is addressed to uh, Senator Lieberman. Uh, you suggest that it might be a good idea for legislators to lay out the uh, minimal, minimal criteria for an acceptable deal. Could you lay out for, for us what would be that kind of a list of minimal yes. criteria for a good deal? Th thank you for asking that question, because I think this is a really critical interim period. Probably it's gonna be hard to get time on the floor for this I suppose it's possible somebody could put it on the National Defense Authorization Act, but probably not. And, and it may be, and that's just as effective, may be expressed in a letter. I'm thinking, we, used to, we, we did this, Congress does this all the time. A letter to the President, to the Secretary of State, uh, basically saying, um, uh, we, here we are, Corker legislation passed. Um, uh, now, uh, and this will presumably, if there's an agreement, come to us. And we want you to know, Mr. President, Secretary Kerry, that we will have a vote. And these are our minimal terms to accept an agreement. Uh, I mean, it's up to Congress what, what they want to say. I would certainly say, first, anytime, anywhere inspections, bottom line. Uh, second, to the extent that you can state it, uh, that sanctions um, uh, be, be not be removed until there is some real uh, proof, evidence, that the Iranians are keeping uh, their part of the bargain. But, I mean, others in Congress may have other points of view. I just think it's, a, it's an important preface to those ultimate votes because now Congress has set up the procedure in the Corker legislation, frankly, in some ways in fairness, but also to make a point, they ought to express themselves, hopefully, on an equally bipartisan basis as they voted for Corker's bill uh, about what standards they will bring to the vote they will cast on the, uh, on the agreement. Anybody else in the audience? One more right here. Okay. Mark, you want to do? Oh. Right. Thanks very much, and thank you very much to, to the co-chairman of the task force, to John. I just want to ask a question that, uh, that actually hasn't been touched upon. The two dimensions of Iran's nuclear program that are of concern, certainly to the task force. One is this issue of the sunset provision. This idea, and I think you've all alluded to this, that this nuclear deal, regardless of the restrictions, many of these restrictions are going to be sunsetting, disappearing. Uh, in 10 years. Uh, most will be gone in 15 years. And in fact, Iran will emerge with an industrial size nuclear infrastructure, not with one year breakout, but actually with zero breakout, undetectable breakout. And that may happen even earlier, according to President Obama, that may happen at year 13. So the issue of the sunset provision, the sort of temporary nature of the nuclear restrictions in exchange for permanent sanctions relief. And the second key element You've talked about verification and inspection, but the Iranians have been stonewalling the IAEA for years on issues of the possible military dimensions of Iran's program, otherwise known as PMDs. Can you have a proper verification and inspection regime without full disclosure on PMDs and the ability to actually talk to the scientists and get the documentation to determine what Iran has actually done in the past and what it may still be doing? Mark, I think all of us will have comments, but I'll ju just jump in quickly. I want to I want to talk to Fakhrizade, and I want to talk to him at Mo at uh, Parchin. Okay, and and if we get that, then I'll can you just say who that who that is? Yeah, I'm sorry. Quickly. He's he's the 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 Oppenheimer of the Iranian nuclear program, mm -hmm. and I want to talk to him, and I want to do it at I want to do it at Parchin, which is a facility these guys have been trying to get to for a decade. Now I know they aren't going to find anything at Parchin. I mean, it it's been destroyed and paved over. But they still can't get there, and and I, and if you look if you look at the four-page white paper about what it was we think was agreed, uh, PMDs previous military dimensions are something that remain a hope to be resolved at some point in the future. They are not a prerequisite 
to signing an agreement. And just going back to, to my narrow intelligence lane, all right, it, it, it creates an increased burden on verification if I don't have high confidence in where the Iranians actually are, not just in fissile material development, but in their weaponization program. And, and you know, we, we do have intelligence estimates, but they remain estimates. And they have, for, for a country that says, that's not our objective, they have refused to come clean on their past. And, and, I, and I realize, Mark, that if we insist on that, it's a deal breaker for the Iranians. But I don't know why uh, we have to accept that, that premise. Uh, how, how can we know their intent? How can we know their capacity for breakout or sneak out without high confidence in where it is they are right now? Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I would add that as another <laughs> element to the whatever expression by members of Congress on, on the PMD particularly. It, it, it probably is a, a deal breaker. But how can you make a deal with a country that uh, won't agree to uh, that kind of reasonable term and has uh, stiff-armed the IAEA, which I need not remind this audience is not uh, you know, a branch of the United States government, but of the United Nations? With apologies, I have to okay. go. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a wonderful yes. discussion. All right, uh, with that, we're going to close it out. Mark Dubowitz has got a few final final comments if people can. Uh, thank you, Senator Lieberman. Thank in you, your, General Hayden, seat. Senator By, John. Thank you very much. And I want to especially thank uh, Ray Take from the Council of Foreign Relations, who actually was the uh, originator of the idea behind the Iran Task Force. So, Ray, thanks for uh, inviting me to be your partner in this. The task force at uh, has 10 memos that we put out, 10 reports. 11th memo will be coming out in the next week. I want to thank Ali Heinen in particular, who's been a great participant in the task force and brings his extensive experience with the IAEA. Ali's one of the few people in Washington who's actually had to spend a lot of time negotiating with Iranian nuclear scientists, and he has uh, a lot of expertise and a lot of war stories about that most pleasant experience. So taskforceoniran.org is where you'll find the materials. Look for more memos, more reports coming from the task force, and we welcome a vig vigorous debate on this issue over the coming months. And uh, again, look forward to seeing all of you at future events. So thank you again.